would like to welcome you to this uh, very important event, uh, which is the launching of uh, Cordillera Children's Book on Weaving. This very noble uh, project is part of the Corditex research uh, being undertaken by the, by the University of the Philippines uh, Baguio faculty, uh, headed by the director of the Museo Cordillera, Dr. Annaline Salvador Amores, and other colleagues from the different disciplines in the social sciences, management, uh, arts and communications, and College of Science. I am very proud of this uh, project because it exemplifies what we do, which is to conduct interdisciplinary researches on various topics and issues in the Cordillera region and Northern Luzon. Uh, these books uh, satisfy a, a need uh, today, uh, which is to transmit indigenous knowledge you know, uh, to the current and future generation of uh, uh, people, especially among the indigenous peoples in the Cordillera and Northern Luzon. As we know, the knowledge bearers and the master craftsmen and women in weaving, as particularly, many of them are getting old, some are passing away, others have gone abroad for greener pastures, and so there's a need to uh, continue teaching the tradition uh, of weaving so that it will not, it will not die, no? uh, so that culture will also continue to flourish. So congratulations again, uh, Dr. Amores and Tim, and uh, mabuhay kayo at ipagpatuloy ninyo ang inyong ginagawang um, uh, mga proyekto para sa kultura, para sa lipunan ng mga katutubo sa Cordillera. Thank you. of stories and in a bell. That is why I have such an affinity to our country's rich textile tradition. Pinagmamalaki ko, nakasama ako sa proyektong ito. Ang mga aklat na ito ay hindi lang mga kwento. Sa loob ng mga pahina ay ang ating sining, kultura, at kasaysayan. Maraming maraming salamat sa creative team, sa Corditex, at sa UP Baguio, to our weavers, agyaman na ako.
Benita and the Binobodan, an Ifugao story. Written by Marlon Martin, edited by Liu Liwang Malabed, illustrated by Kaisel Kotiwan. My name is Benita Balamto, 66 years old, and I am a weaver. I was born in the village of Kudo in Lagawi, Ifugao. My mother, like most women in my village, was a weaver. I remember when I was a child, I was my mother's assistant. Every time I was out playing, I would hear my mother calling, waving rods and threads in her arms. I imagined those balls of yarn mocking me. They bounced around in my mind, so happy to see me dragged away from the games we used to play. Of course I would grumble. My grumbling would continue while I passed the yarns to the loom header and then to my mother. Back and forth, back and forth, a thousand times. I would have reached Kiangan and back again if I were to add all those little steps it took to warp a fabric just to make a tiny skirt for me. You can imagine my muttering when my mother decides to warp a whole blanket. Even now that I have grown up and have a family of my own, weaving is still part of my life. From a weaver's assistant, I decided to do weaving myself. In the weaving village of Amganad, Banawe, all my neighbors were weavers, and they were eager to teach me. We wove traditional garments that we sold to other villages. It was difficult at first, but just like my mother, my teachers were patient until I was able to perfect my first plain striped fabric. After mastering the weaving of palahan skirts of the Burnai people, I saw the binobodan or ikat fabric that the senior weavers were making for the Kiangan people. I heard of an old weaver who was a moonbobod. Her name was Kitayan, and she was a master ikat weaver in the village. Kitayan knew the Amganad weaver, Kahimngan Palatik, who learned the ikat technique from the Kiangans and taught it to her villagers. They wove the traditional ikat loincloths and skirts of the Kadangyan, the Ifugao noble class. I visited Ina Kitayan and she willingly showed me how Binobodan was done. It was harder than I imagined, but I wanted to learn, so I patiently followed the step-by-step -step process. Soon enough, I was bringing my first ikat weaves to the Banawi market and bringing home food for our family. I learned the standard designs of our traditional Ifugao ikat, but I also came up with new ones. Again, the threads were beckoning to me. They are now my tools, my friends, my playmates. I think hard, play the patterns in my mind, visualize what it would look like. Then I start tying the patterns on the warp. There is no room for error, for there is no way of correcting your patterns once you cast the die. More people want to buy my binobodan, but one can only weave so much. So my boys and girls would assist me in the warping and winding threads into balls. You see, when you ask one to help you, you need to ask them all. Otherwise, you'll end up with no one. And just like my mother, I pulled them away from their games and taught them a skill they can use. I'm glad I did. Four of my daughters are now weavers, and the art of binobonan leaves with it. Dalipog 
and the Isnag Badu, an Apayao story. Written by Joy Peace Liapitan and Annaline Salvador Amores. Illustrated by Jed Alangi. A young Isnagman, Dalipog, lives in a village in Puddol, Apayao. He is industrious and gentle, and everyone in the village adores him. He lives with his grandmother, Ako Maginay, who was once Adurarakit. Adurarakit is a respected spiritual guide of the village. Ako Maginay always talks of the past, how they happily lived in Daya, an Isnag community in the mountains. This was the time before they were driven to the lowlands by the rebels. She remembers how people run away with what they can carry, leaving behind the precious heirlooms of the Isnag, their beads, their precious colorful clothing, and even the jars. Now, they are living in the Patad, but they still speak the Isnag language. One afternoon, Ako Maginay brings out an old wooden chest hidden underneath her bed and shows its contents to the Lipug. There are colorful clothes that were given to her by her mother when she was young and the garment that her husband gave as a gift when they got married. They are beautifully embroidered and intricately adorned. Ako Maginay slowly lays them out on the floor for the lipog to see. There is the Arigririhi, there is a Binabalu and Sinayunga. Here is the Dinahat and the Balandan. There are also other blankets used during the Sayam or ritual celebration. The lipog turns to his ako and asks, I am an Isnag and I live with other Isnag. But why do I not see anyone wear these beautiful clothes, Ako? Apo, you see our people wear Isnag clothing, but not the authentic ones made by our ancestors. The ones worn in cultural festivals, like the Nangitit Badu, or dark blouses, lack the soul. They only imitate the true Isnag textiles. We do not see the real ones because they were buried with their owners, his grandmother replies. The Lipog is stunned by what Ako shared. He silently watched Ako Maginay fold and return the garments in the old chest. You will understand, Apo. You will understand. These are the only ones I took with me when we fled our home. I kept these all these years. These are my treasures from the past, Ako Maginay explains to her grandson. Still thinking about Ako Maginay's wonderful chest of clothes, the Lipug takes a walk around the village. He sits under a kamagong tree to get out of the harsh heat of the sun. The cool breeze makes the Lipug fall asleep and dream. In the Lipug's dream, the ancestor spirits take him to his Akos village, to the past. The villagers wear the Isnag's traditional clothes, like the treasures in Ako Maginay's chest. In the old village, there are gallant and respected men who wear the badiyo and the ipot. There is a durarakit with an iku, or a miniature axe, tucked on her headdress. The Dudararakit explains what the patterns on the Isnag clothing mean. The Inari Grihi is the most important and highly prized upper garment. It is decorated with pontas in different colors and patterns. It is only worn by the affluent Isnag. Layers of blue and red fabric tucked into the armhole called Pinuntasan, symbolize true Isnag spirit. There is the Baluku, or the scallop pattern 
that refers to the Sinulong River. The Sinabungan symbolizes the flower of the wild rice. The Kamamay, the smallest and finest rice variety of Isnag, celebrates productivity and abundance. There is the Sinan Ahamay, or centipede pattern, that serves as a protection from bad spirits, and the zigzag patterns that represent the mountains of Ngahan. The Durarakit explains to the Lipog, We dye our threads from the fibers and bark of the trees. Later, we barter with the lowlanders for yards of dyed textile from Ilocos. We make this intricate embroidery so no one can copy it, to make it different from the others. In the Sayam, you will see all of these. Just when the Durarakit starts the ritual, the Lipug wakes up. He looks at his village. He sees Ako Maginay, whose eyesight is failing. He remembers her bidding to dress her up in her Isnag Badu when the time comes for her to go. This will ensure that her ancestors will recognize her in the next life. As the Lipug walks back home, he vows to learn more about his culture, to sit and talk with the remaining elders in his village, to preserve the traditional clothes that his Isnag ancestors once wore. Fataan and her Dilar, a Bontoc weaving story. Written by Annaline Salvadora Morris and illustrated by Kelly Ramos. In the village of Kano in Bontoc, at the end of the harvest season, the mothers taught their young children how to weave on a pinahod. Fataan learned how to weave at a young age. She started with a small piece of cloth. As she grew, she wove longer and longer cloth on her practice loom that her father made. Fatan watched the old women weave special kinds of garments for the dead. These are specially woven clothes for the Hachangyan, the rich people in Bontok. The upper garment for the women is pure white with minamata designs. Fatan found the eye-like designs comforting. It is like the eyes of her ancestors watching over her. There were also blankets with lines of dark colors and lowing cloths with a special weave for the elder Kachangyan male. Fatan wanted to learn how to weave all these garments, but it is prohibited for a young woman to weave death garments. The elders believe that a young woman who weaves these will not bear children. The time came when Fatan had to leave the village to go to Poblacion. She then got married and started a family in Baguio City. Far from Kan O, she never forgot how to weave. Her weaving is like a thread that binds her to her village. She practiced on her pinahod, then learned how to weave on a tilar, 
or the futun of the Ilocanos. Using a futun, she could weave longer cloths that she can sell for a higher price. Fatan asked her husband, Tanungan, who was a carpenter to make a telar. With her own futun, she can continue weaving in her home and take care of her small children. One day, Fatan saw the two backstrap looms she inherited. Her mother also got them from her own mother, Apo Chowit. She remembered how patient her mother was in teaching her how to weave when she was young. She recalled her mother patiently moving the warp and weft over and over to produce the designs on the fabric. She suddenly missed her village, the place where she grew up, where she learned how to weave. Fatan returned home to Kan O. She gathered the women there, showing them how they can improve their weaving. Her husband taught the men how to build footlooms for their wives. Soon, the women were producing colorful skirts and blankets on their own telar. These skirts and blankets were brought to Bontok Poblacion and sold there. Now, whenever she goes home to Kan O, Fatan hears the sound of weaving in her village. She is happy to hear the shuttles running back and forth over the wefts of the loom in every household. She smiles and is pleased to see her people weaving again. The old weavers continue to weave the death garments while the younger women weave the colorful blankets that we see in the public market today. In Baguio, Fatan continues to teach her friends and students on how to weave. First, on their backstrap looms, and then on the telar. I'm not originally from the Cordilleras. I'm an adopted daughter of Baguio. So, my introduction to Cordillero weaving was through the Baguio Craft Fair ng meeting expedition ni Candy Reyes Alipio. Um, Umiikot-ikot kami ng kids doon sa craft fair sa kanto before. Tapos may nakita kaming nag-weave doon. Ayun, hindi ko alam. Si Kathy na pala yun. Yung master weaver na nag-workshop. Tapos yung tinuturoan niya, si Cora na pala. Hindi ko pa sila kilala noon. Tapos si Kathy pala si Patan, whom I will meet later to illustrate her story for this Cordy textbook na sulat ni Ikin for this project. Galing, di ba? Tapos, syempre, paan ako ng Museo Cordillera, so andun ako sa lahat ng opening nila. Tapos, binabalik-balikan namin ng kids yung exhibition. So, I saw Batok, Peace of Merit. Tapos, syempre, nakita ko din yung Hand Woven Tales, the Warp and Weft of Cordillera Textiles. Nakita ko yung naka-exhibit na textiles, napanood namin how it's done, tapos we got to touch the tools and implements. Pero, I really got to internalize weaving when Ikin and Gora and Choan invited me to be part of Agabel Tayo, itong project na to. They were trying to come up with a team of artists that Gora would train to make children's book illustrations for Corditex. I said yes, as I always do, and the first meeting was at the Cordillera Study Center's office ni Ikin. We brought our character studies for Cora and Ikin to check. Tapos, that was when I met Fataan. I invited Chani Ikin so that I could talk to her about her story. So, the grieving session kami kaagad. After that meeting, I have a ton of reference photos um, from that meeting for my illustrations. But more than that, with Kathy's guidance, I was able to weave a few inches of yarn into fabric. I got an adrenaline rush after those first few inches of cloth and weaving. Weaving is addicting. If I had a chance, I would weave again. I am still actually hoping to go to that village of weavers in the story. Maybe someday after all of this COVID madness. But for now, dito na lang muna tayo sa virtual. So, hi Baguio! Enjoy the launch!
Aramay Sinon, A Gadang Weaving Story Written by Margaret Balansi and Annalyn Salvador Amores Illustrated by Justine Gabriela Amores I am Aramay. I am a Gadang. In the past, the Gadang were highly nomadic people. When I was young, we moved to different places with my family. We were always in search of fertile land to till and the place that is rich in food source. My ancestors wore bark clothing to protect them from harsh weather and to keep their bodies warm at night. They made their own clothing from the litak, the bark of the trees. Later on, they learned how to weave. The women, weaving on their backstrap looms, while the men, weaving rattan baskets at the back of their homes. Everybody kept busy while waiting for the harvest season. My mother, in Nabukai, was a master weaver. She wove the most beautiful of gadang textiles. But a gadang garment is not woven overnight. It takes months of hard work and it all starts with a kapat. She would plant the kapat together with the apai or rice. The kapat and apai are harvested at the same time. Then she would carefully separate the seeds, bite the cotton, and wrap them in a kukot or betel nut sheath. One day I asked Ina Bugay, where did you learn to weave, Ina? Oh, it was taught to me by my mother a long time ago. I also have to teach you one day, she said. The day came, and my mother was patient as she taught me every step of the masinun, turning the kapat into threads, dyeing them with plant dyes, spinning the threads, warping the threads, and weaving on my backstrap loom that my father made. The process was very tedious. It would take days, weeks, and months to finish one piece because of the distinct designs found on gadang cloth. One of the most elaborate patterns is the inamata, also known as sinaku. I also learned the lalad or striped pattern, the ilintu one or teeth-like patterns, and the analifambang or butterfly designs. My backstrap loom would sing as I produced yards of textiles. My loom is light, made of fine wood and bamboo. The bamboo has little pebbles inside to keep me awake, and when shaken, it produces a soft and calming sound. Weaving was difficult, but the joy of finishing a colorful cloth made me happy. I even decorated my work with amiru or embroidery and bukat, the small glass beads we traded with salt up north. I made a set of clothing for myself, for my parents, and my siblings. They were all pleased. When I got married, I stopped weaving. We moved to the patad, into my husband's house. I wanted to weave while I raised a small family, but the materials I needed were not available. Here, there was no pure cotton, no natural dye, and no inspiration from my old home in Paracelis Mountain Province. I learned that in the public market, Threads were sold. They come in different colors. I thought I could go back to weaving, but the threads do not feel soft and raw. The colors were too gaudy, too bright. I could not produce the natural color that I wanted for the traditional gadang attire I was going to weave. A true weaver should have the finest materials. In respect to our ancestors and the anitos that taught the gadang people how to weave, I decided to stop weaving. To weave differently from what is traditional is to offend the spirits. I set aside my singing backstrap loom for a while. The sound it produces is faint now. I thought it was time for it to rest. I still wore my akin, a handwoven wraparound skirt that my mother gave me when I was young. It is now 60 years old, and it is still sturdy, and the color is still bright. I long to weave to make my loom sing again. One day, my grandchildren invited me to come home to Paracelis. I said yes. I wanted to visit my relatives and friends. I was surprised to see my old home changed. The roads were wide and cemented. The shrubs where we got our cotton were gone. And the trees were cut down to give way to houses and buildings. Bananas, corn, and rice replaced the plant dyes. Even the tayum or indigo dye was gone. The river where we used to wash our newly dyed cloths, had dried up. Many of my old friends had passed away. 
My sadness turned to joy when I saw my grandchildren and their mother show interest in weaving. They kept some of the gadang clothes their parents left behind and are now learning the process of how to make them. Even if I am old with poor eyesight, I patiently taught them how to weave gadang textiles. All the cotton is gone, so we used the colorful polyester threads from the Baguio City Public Market. The young women, I thought, are weaving the traditional patterns on their backstrap looms, using the new materials readily available from the market. I am pleased that their daughters, and even their friends, are patiently learning how to weave, do embroidery, and beadwork for our traditional attire. They are continuing the art of Masino. Hello everyone, I am Justin and I illustrated for the book Aramay Sinan A Gadang Weaving Story. In the process, we were able to look at textiles, weaving implements, photographs, and actual research hand in hand with Manang Margareth and the Corditex team for reference and storyboards. I also took some photos of myself to imitate weaving positions. I mainly used watercolor and gouache on paper. It was a bit of a challenge illustrating, but this project was far the most fun and exciting I've ever done. I hope this book will inspire Filipino kids to share the love for our culture, tradition, and most especially for weaving. Thank you so much Corditex and Gadang community for giving me a chance to draw your story. Ako po si Margaret Balansi at uh, nice ko lamang pong magpasalamat sa bumubuo ng Corditex project sa Misayo Cordillera, sa UP Baguio, especially po kay uh, Dr. Ikin Salvador Amores sa pagpili po sa amin ng mga gadang ethnolinguistic group para makagawa po ng children's book ng mga, na mga tungkol sa weaving ng Cordillera. Isa pong napakalaking opportunity po para sa amin na mapasali po sa, sa project na ito at ma-share namin kung ano yung mga uh, natutunan namin at alam namin tungkol sa sa weaving or paghahabi ng mga gaadang. Sana po ay maging inspirasyon itong children's book na ito para para ma-inspire yung mga magbabasa at ma-inspire pa yung ibang mga gustong magsulat ng libro. And sana ay may mga matutunan din yung mga bata na magbabasa nito na kailangan na pahalagahan at uh, protektahan at kailangan na ipagmalaki kung, sa, kung saan kagaling at kung gaano kayaman ang mga uh, kultura at sining na minanapan natin sa ating mga ninuno. So, sana po uh, uh, looking forward for making more books <laughs> at sana po ay uh, maging successful itong launching ng, ng Corditex uh, Children's Books na ito. At sana maraming sumuporta at sana po ay Um, maraming matututunan yung mga magbabasa nito. Yun lamang po. Maraming salamat. Balita na islaktob. 
A Kalinga Weaving Story, written by Renaline Albert and Annalyn Salvador Amores, and illustrated by Danielle Florendo. Balitanay is the granddaughter of Apu Dumla, an old weaver in the village of Nanin Kalinga. Balitanay lives with her parents in Manila. Balitanay first hears about her Apu Dumla one summer day when she was eight years old. Balitanay's mother says, Let us go back to the Ili, our village. My Auntie Dumla told me that there is Inanchila Festival. Let us visit our relatives and have our fill of the rice cakes. I have not tasted Inanchila for a long time. Our grandmothers make them, and they are delicious. Balitanay's almond eyes are round with excitement. Rice cakes? My favorite! Her mother shows her wrap-around skirt with laktob designs to Balitanay. I cannot wait for you to meet your Apu Dumna. She made this for me when I was your age. She tells the best stories. Balitanay rushes to her room and starts packing her new dress so she can wear it to the festival. She wants to show Apu Dumla her favorite story character, a superhero printed on the dress. Balitanay's family rides the bus for 10 hours from Manila to Kalinga. When they reach the village, Balitanay is enchanted with the rice fields. Everything here is green, she quips happily. Mama, what are those tiny huts for? asks Balitanay, referring to the century-old agamong. Those are really old rice granaries, Balitanay, her mother answers. Older than me? Balitanay asks. Yes. Older than you? Yes. Older than Apu Dumla? Yes, 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 yes. Her mother laughs. When they are near, Apu Dumla hurriedly stands up and leaves the backstrap loom that she had been working at for days. Apu Dumla waits at the door and greets them. Welcome home! The smell of brewed coffee and hot inanchila embraces the weary travelers. Balitanay enters the old house of Apu Dumla and sees the sticks and threads lying on the ground. What are these, Lola? She asks. Oh, those make a loom, Balitanay, her grandmother says. A loom? wonders Balitanay. Yes, a loom. That is how we make our clothes. The grandmother's weave. We call it Sinon, explains Apudula. The next morning, it's the Inanchila festival. The children and their parents join the parade. The men wear lanlan, and the women wear wrap-around skirts. Apu Dumla shows Balitanay a finely woven skirt. Would you like to wear a lakto? I finally finished the one I was weaving. This is for you. Balitanay does not even look at the skirt her grandmother made for her. But Lola, I am now wearing my new dress. That is fine, Balitanay. Apu Dumna slowly folds the laktob. In the parade, Balitanay notices that everyone is wearing traditional clothes. My neighbors are all wearing the laktob. The next day, Balitanay looks at the skirt woven by Apu Dumna. She runs her fingers over the laktob. It is beautiful, she whispers in awe. She touches the threads that her grandmother used for the skirt. They are fine and smooth. She wonders how the tangle of sticks and thread could produce a lovely skirt. Apu Dumla sees Balitanay looking at her loom. She sits next to her granddaughter. Balitanay bows her head and says, I'm sorry, Lola. I did not wear the skirt you made. Apu Dumla pats Balitanay's shoulder and tells a story. 
A long time ago, our people could not get any clothing to cover their bodies. The early Kalinga discovered a tree called Torak. Its bark has a soft texture once it was pounded well. Your great-great Lolos took the bark of the tree, bit and chewed on it, removed the stiff parts, and dried the bark. He then put the pieces of bark together, twisted and shook them, until they turned out to be like pieces of cloth. I kept your great-great Lolo's loincloth. Here, have a look. This used to be the bark of a tree, Balita Nai wonders aloud. Yes, Balita Nai. After your Lolo learned that the Torak bark could be transformed into a cloth, the people found a tree called Alinao. These are small trees with thread-like fibers that were used to mend the dried bark of Torak. Your great-great Lola used the wider bark as skirts for the women, while the small and long ones were used by the men. Balita Nai says, Lolos Lan Lan! Apudumna nods and continues her story. We were able to get some threads at the market when we traded with the lowlanders. Some of our women learned how to weave from nearby towns. Your Lola Dula taught us how to use the backstrap loom when we were small. When the American missionaries came, the young women learned how to do embroidery. They took their mother's woven cloths and embroidered them with flowers, birds, and plants. They embroidered kalapoy or butterflies, pakoy or rice, and even gayaman or centipedes. Oh, they captured butterflies and centipedes and put them on the clothes? Balitanay exclaims. Yes, Balitanay. The designs are beautiful and our Ili Nanang is the only place where you can find woven clothes with these kinds of embroidery. But sadly, only a few master weavers remain and the young ones prefer to wear ready-made clothes. Balita Nai sees the pride and sadness in Apudumna's eyes. She stands up and wears the laktob her grandmother made. For many more summers, Balita Nai always comes home to her grandmother's village. She always wears the skirt that Apudumna wove for her. One day, when her laktob no longer fits, she hides it away like a treasure and utters a promise. Apudumla, I will learn to do the sinon. Hello, I am Danielle and I am the illustrator for Balitanais Laktob. I started my career in children's book illustration after I received my bachelor's degree in fine arts. When I was approached by the Corditex project, I was given the opportunity to choose what story to take and I particularly chose the Kalinga story. I realized how important it is to preserve our culture. It's a part of us, it's a part of our individuality and will always be part of our identity wherever we go. I wanted to be very particular and I wanted to be very specific when I was illustrating this story, especially on the textiles. When I was studying the textiles, I realized how intricate every single strand and every weave was. So in my watercolor illustrations, I made sure I could translate that properly into paper. So thank you Corditex Project for this opportunity and I hope that you enjoy Palita Naisi.